Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you all for attending. All right. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. So we're here today to present the first working draft of the new form based code for the city of Puno Gorda. And we're really excited to finally get to show you everything we've been working on so far. So with that, um, just what we're going to be covering today specifically, I'm going to go over very quickly through the timeline and where we are in the process. And then we'll go right into the actual form based code and take a close look at what the regulating districts are, what the overlay districts are, and then the building types, architectural standards, and finally the community benefit program. And then we'll have time at the end to do a question and answer as well. All right, so where are we in the process? Um, well, for the code specifically, we did our kickoff meeting in February of this year. We were here in March where we did two code workshops where we invited you all to give us ideas and, and your perspective on you know, what are the building types you think are appropriate in Puna Gorda and where, I mean, what are the types of intensity you think are appropriate? And following those workshops in March, we got right started on the actual code. So right now, like I said, we're presenting the draft in progress code to you all tomorrow. We're also doing an open house at Lashley Marina. There will be three times for that, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., also from 12 to 2 p.m., and from 5 to 7. So if you're interested in any topic that you hear today, or you want to know more, or really dig into some of the details of the code, or even just understand how to use it, definitely stop by and uh, we'll be there to walk you through it and answer any questions you have. And then we're shooting to release the public, uh, the first draft of the form-based code, October 8th. So definitely stay tuned for that. We'll notify all of you. We have your email, so um, you'll know exactly where you can find it. And all of that is with the goal of getting us to the second draft of the code after we get all your feedback and input sometime between November and December of this year, and then getting into public hearings to adopt the new code sometime in January through March of next year. All right, so this is the final phase in what has been a three-phase process. We've been working in Puna Gorda for just about three years now. We started with our citywide master plan, then started work on the comprehensive plan update. We got through the first draft of the comprehensive plan update, took a pause so that we could focus on the code. And the goal is really to adopt both the updated comprehensive plan and the new code together at once. And with that, we'll dive into the code. So just to take a step back, what do we think about when we're trying to update a city's land development regulations? There's a lot of different things we have to keep in mind. Is it easy to understand? Is it clear to any property owner what's allowed on each parcel? Um, do the proposed development regulations reduce previous development rights? That's something we definitely don't want to do. So we have to make sure we're not reducing property rights for any particular parcel. Do the what do what the regulations allow actually match the needs of the city from a housing and economic development perspective? Do they also relate to what the community wants to see in their neighborhoods, the type of development, the character that people want to see? Uh, are parking regulations prohibitive for the kind of small scale and appropriate development that the community wants? Um, so lots of things that we're thinking about as we get into this. So we opted for a form-based code for this portion of Puna Corda, which is specifically kind of the traditionally and historically platted neighborhoods around and in downtown Puna Corda. And the pros of doing a form-based code is that it's a very visual document. It's easy to see it and understand it without having to read a lot of text. Um, it gives you a lot more predictability as to the character and quality of the development. Also, you can be much more fine-grained into the unique types of buildings and places that you want to allow and promote more uh, you know, positive building to street relationships that actually promote walkability and vibrant neighborhoods, which we know is a huge priority for this city based on all the work we did during the master plan. Um, and also to streamline the development process. Oh, that's very dark. <laughs> um, I don't know if we want to keep it this dark. Is it better for you all to see it like this? Okay, so we'll, we'll keep it. Um, so now the key ideas that we were focused on when looking at what changes we were going to implement in the code 
were a couple of things. One, allowing for a vari greater variety of housing types that your existing code is limiting right now. And that includes calibrating density to get the kinds of development that were historically permitted in the city, but have not, that currently are now not permitted any longer. And we'll go into some of these building types through the presentation. Um, also, establishing new land use categories, and we'll show you the map of those different areas and districts. Establishing building types and architectural styles that are permitted in specific areas. And this is where you can get a lot more control over the development you're going to get. We wanted to clarify uh, policy language, taking the policies we established in the comprehensive plan and making sure they're being implemented in the code. And then clarifying some things. We are, we're going to be establishing some new local register historic districts as a part of this code, introducing a maker and interchange commercial overlay. Um, and revising and tweaking the actual numerical standards as they exist today in the code. So there's four key sections that make up the form-based code. The first one um, that we're going to cover right now are the regulating districts and the building types. And these really go hand in hand. These tell you what are the different regulatory areas within the form-based code. And here you can see a list of them, downtown core, all the way to parks and open space. And then what are the kinds of buildings that you can build in each of those areas? So that's what we're gonna start with right now. So again, we have the downtown core regulating district, the village center, the flex commercial corridor, the maker village, neighborhood transition, residential edge, traditional residential and parks and open space. And then we have a number of different building types that are really meant to represent all the kinds of development you really want to get within the form-based code area. So what are the types of rules that you'll find within the regulating districts? So regulating districts are controlling things like lot coverage. So what amount of the lot can be covered by a building? Also frontage build out, which is how much linear footage along the actual street has to be covered by a building. When you have things like attached housing, like row houses, things like that, those will cover 100% of the front of the building. The buildings you see along Marion in downtown, those are covering 100% of the front of the, of the lot because they all are attached to one another. Then we have maximum building height and density, setbacks, parking setbacks, encroachments, which means how different elements within the building can project beyond the minimum setback, things like porches, which are allowed to project a little bit further out than the entire building can. And then we also have um, additional standards like permitted building types and architectural style. These are actually what are going to help ensure get the most predictable development possible. Building types specifically regulate things like the lot width, depth and area, different building types will need different size lots. So the type of uh, minimum lot size you may need for a single family detached house is very different from what you need from a larger mixed use building, like some of the ones you see downtown. Also the number of units, residential units that are allowed with each building type, the density and height of each building type, the specific location of parking. So we have general parking setbacks in the regulating district, but certain building types may have even more specific rules as to where the parking can be. Um, and then again, going back to the form-based standards that really control what the building is going to look like. We have rules that account for fenestration, which means the amount and the transparency of windows and doors and the permitted types of roofs the different building elements, which could be things like balconies or chimneys um, and different frontage types as well. These are all things that uh, are permitted for specific building types. Okay, so here is the actual regulating plan with the different regulating districts. And we're gonna go through these one by one, starting from uh, the least intense to the most intense. So, and, and these do follow very closely some of your existing zoning districts. There's not a lot of change in the areas you're used to seeing with few, few exceptions. So we'll start with parks and open space. Again, definitely the least intense. The only buildings allowed here 
are recreational in nature or civic. So um, this, encompass, this encompasses the public lands owned by the city, but the primary purpose is providing recreation, parks, and open spaces that benefit the whole community. Um, and so these have to be accessible by the public, very limited amount of buildings allowed in this district, and it really serves civic uses. And so the allowed building types in this specific regulating district, the only type, is what we're calling the civic institutional building type. So we have a specific building type that covers a range of different buildings from civic buildings to religious buildings to uh, institutional buildings of a variety of scales. So this is a building type that's meant to allow for many different kinds of buildings that don't necessarily fit a conventional role like a house would or a duplex would. The next regulating district moving up in intensity is what we call traditional residential. These are you know, the one and two family neighborhoods that make up a, a large part of this form-based code area. A lot of them are what today is the NR10 um, zoning district, for those of you who are familiar with the existing zoning. So the traditional residential, this is the least intense area besides parks and open space. And it's meant to allow both detached and attached residential um, on narrow to average size lots with small to medium setbacks up to two and a half stories with an elevated ground floor like most residential is here, especially in Florida. And the frontage types that we're requiring here include things like stoops, corticos, uh, porches. Um, those are kind of the, the required frontages. You have a, a menu of frontages you're allowed to use. Um, but you have to pick one essentially to front the building. So the building types that are allowed in the traditional residential district are the house, the accessory cottage, which is only allowed in conjunction with the house and the row house and the live work. So you can only put your accessory cottage in a couple of other building types. And you have the cottage court, which is a collection of small bungalows or cottages on one lot facing a central shared space. And then the duplex. So this is the lowest density district of all of the regulating districts. And these are the only buildings in addition to civic buildings that you can build in this district. So the next, the next regulating district is the residential edge. So this one closely follows, though not exactly, the NR15 existing zoning district. And this is meant to be still a residential area, but it's starting to provide a transition from the least or the lowest density residences to something a little bit more intense. So it really occurs along the borders of the traditional residential areas, um, still has detached and attached residential, narrow to average lot widths, small to medium setbacks, but it does allow one additional story. So now instead of two and a half stories, you can go up to three and a half. And again, this is actually set in, in numerical height standards too, but just as a um, overview. And it has the same kind of frontages that are allowed in the traditional residential. So the building types that are permitted here, in addition to all the ones that you already saw, were kind of Adding on now, each, each new district has a couple more building types that are permitted. So in addition to the house and the accessory cottage and the duplex, we're also permitting the row house, which is an attached single family residence, the triplex and fourplex, which allows a three unit and four unit homes, and the multiplex, which is generally five to 12 units within the building. Now, the next regulating district is what we call the neighborhood transition. So this one is a district that is transitioning between purely residential neighborhoods and mixed use neighborhoods. So along the edges of areas like the downtown core or the village center, you have these transitional areas where the scale of the buildings is meant to match the residential neighborhoods, but we're allowing a couple more mixed use types So again, this still allows detached and attached residential, 
but it's also going to allow some small footprint commercial and mixed use buildings. So buildings here can be a little bit closer to the sidewalk um, and still the same height though that is allowed in the residential edge. So now we can go through the actual building types. So the only residential type that we've added with the neighborhood transition is the courtyard apartment. Besides that, it allows all the same residential types as the residential edge. In addition to adding the courtyard apartment, the neighborhood transition districts allow for some mixed use and commercial buildings, including live work buildings, which are very similar to row houses or small residences that also allow somebody to have a business. The Main Street shop front, which is very similar to the building types along Marion, near Main Street. The neighborhood shop front, which is a, a commercial building that looks like a home. You guys have a lot of great examples of these in town of homes that were converted to restaurants or a cafe or a boutique. Um, you know, Pizza Gorda is an example. Just we, we really like that type. It's very unique to Puna Gorda. So we wanted to make sure that kind of development is allowed. And then finally, the small footprint mixed use. So this is a two to three story building that has ground floor of commercial retail and then upper floors, which can be an office or apartments. Okay, so now we're going to the Maker Village. And this one is very, very closely matches your special purpose district in your current zoning code. And this is a pretty unique one in that it has a lot of light industrial uses and warehouse buildings today. And so we had to accommodate for those kinds of buildings when thinking about the building types. So this one has small to medium setbacks. Um, it does allow for some side yard parking, unlike a lot of the other districts we've talked about. And we had to make some exceptions for this district and the next one to you know, be flexible about where the parking can be given the uses that we find in this district. Still, the height is limited to three stories, like a lot of the surrounding areas. And it's mixed use and allows a lot of different buildings. So in addition to the residential types that we just described, we're adding on two special buildings. One is the loft, which could be an office. It could be offices. It could be commercial, or it could be residential. And a warehouse type there's already a lot of warehouses and we want to make sure that you're still able to do a warehouse. Um, we may require you know, certain entry types to, to ensure that the warehouse has a good building to street relationship. Um, but we want to make sure that that kind of building is still very much permitted within the code. All right, moving on to the flex commercial district. So this one, it follows your highway commercial zoning right now. So it's a lot of the more uh, suburban strip commercial that you find along US 41 um, north of Airport Road. And this one is pretty unique from the other ones. We wanted to give this district the most flexibility possible. So buildings are primarily detached buildings, medium to large footprint. Up until now, we've been dealing with small sized lots in general. So this is one where we are allowing much larger footprint lots um, and buildings. Small to medium setbacks. Again, like the Maker Village, we are allowing side yard parking, which means parking that's next to the building instead of behind it. Um, and a little bit more height, uh, the opportunity to get more height in this district as well, up to five stories, but only with community benefits. And you'll notice me saying um, the opportunity to get more height for this district and the next one, um, there are three districts that allow the option to get additional height or density through the provision of community benefits. And we'll explain more details about that program at the end. So we do not require specific building types in the flex commercial corridor. And the reason is that we want to make this the most flexible of all the regulating districts in the firm base code. Now developers may choose to follow the building type standards that we've included in the code, especially if they want to achieve additional density for what we're calling missing middle housing types. Those types include row houses, triplex, fourplexes, multiplexes. Those are types that are very difficult, if not impossible to build in most neighborhoods in Punta Gorda today because of the density. 
So, um, and yet they're really important to getting a greater variety and mix of housing types in the city at a variety of price points too. We want to encourage people to be able to do that. So um, for developers in this area who want to build any of those types of housing, uh, then we would require them to follow the building type standards. Now, just because the building type standards are not required doesn't mean they can build whatever they want here. So they still have to follow the general building design standards as a part of our architectural provisions and the frontage standards. Frontage standards, which I'll go into more detail later, basically outline the types of fronts that the building can have facing the sidewalk or the street, whether it's requiring awnings or some kind of canopy or a storefront with uh, some amount of glass to allow light to shine through onto the sidewalk, things like that, that really ensure that the building is going to promote walkability and create a comfortable sidewalk and street experience. All right, almost there, we have two left. So the next one is the village center, which closely follows your current uh, neighborhood center zoning district. And this is focused primarily around the Bayfront Hospital area, um, but also just along East Marion and East Olympia, as well as Fisherman's Village. So uh, this is a higher intensity from some of the other districts we've seen so far. It's meant to allow compact mixed use development that creates really walkable, vibrant neighborhoods, uh, much more urban. So here we have again, small, uh, small setbacks or no setbacks. So that means the building can come all the way up to the sidewalk, which gives you a much more urban environment like what you have in downtown already. Um, you can, again, build up to five stories with community benefits. And so again, we'll explain how those benefits work in just a second. A second, And there are a number of different frontages you can apply to the buildings in this district as well. So in addition to all of the housing types we've already discussed, uh, there is another special building that we're going to add on for the village center, and that's the liner building. That's because the village center, along with the downtown court, is the only district where you can build structured parking. And so along with structured parking, we know that we want to hide parking as much as possible as for good urban design. Uh, and so we require something called a liner building. And that's a much shallower footprint building that's intended to hide parking garages, but also surface parking lots. So that's one that we've added. All right. And in addition to that, we've added one more building type, which is the medium footprint mixed use. This is actually the largest building type that we have. Um, so unlike the small footprint, it can be a little bit bigger um, and it can go a little bit taller. That's really the only difference. An example would be the Sunloft building. That's an example of a medium footprint mixed use building. And finally, we have the downtown court which closely matches your existing city center zoning. Um, and the downtown core, like the village center, is meant to foster a very urban environment. Again, small to no setbacks, which means the buildings can come up close to the sidewalk or right at the sidewalk. Um, this one can go up to six stories with community benefits. So just a little bit more than what is permitted in the village center. And again, there's a variety of different frontage types that are allowed for the buildings here. And in this case, we haven't actually added any other building types. All the building types you've seen from Village Center, including the liner, the uh, medium footprint mixed use, they're all permitted in the downtown core as well, except that we also have the opportunity to achieve great, a greater maximum density and height through the provision of community benefits. Okay, so now I'm just going to quickly go through the overlay district. So we have two overlays that we're establishing. One is the historic districts and landmark overlay, which has four unique historic districts that we're creating, including the downtown historic district, the main street historic district, Gray Street mid-century modern historic district, and a neighborhood conservation district. And then we have the medical overlay. So what are these overlays? 
All that an overlay district is, is it's a special area that has unique rules that may supersede the regulating district standards for specific things. So where we've drawn an overlay, they will have rules, for example, the permitted building types or permitted architectural styles that apply uh, or that supersede that the rules of the underlying regulating district. Another thing that they might have more control over is maximum building height. And I'll explain that now. Here is just a more zoomed in map that shows the actual overlay districts. So again, we have four new local historic districts that will really help protect all of the amazing historic buildings you already have. Um, and in those specifically, we're gonna be controlling the architectural style very carefully. And then there's the medical overlay district, which is around the uh, hospital. Okay, so what is different about the actual historic districts? Well, in the downtown historic district, um, we're limiting the actual architectural styles that are allowed to the ones you see on this list. So the permitted architectural styles for the underlying district has a much larger list or a larger list. But if you're in the downtown historic district, you're limited to these architectural styles. And they were selected based on the existing historic design guidelines that Nagorda has with some tweaks um, to really foster the kinds of buildings that historically have been constructed there. Now we have the Main Street Historic District. So this is specifically in the downtown core. And like the downtown historic district, it is limiting the number of different architectural styles that are permitted. Again, that's to match what is there already. But it also limits the building types to uh, live work, neighborhood shopfront, main street shopfront, and small footprint mixed use, as well as limiting the height to 35 feet. And this one is really important. From the citywide master plan process, we know that there are certain streets where we want to keep the building heights lower on purpose. For example, along Marion, um, along Taylor and Sullivan, there's some really nice commercial retail buildings that are only one and two stories. So by creating this overlay, we're ensuring that whatever gets built directly across the street is gonna match that scale. And so that's why we created this Main Street Historic District to really create true main streets where both sides of the street match in scale and in architectural style. Next, we have the Gray Street Mid-Century Modern Historic District. Punagorda has a really unique cluster of mid-century homes from the 50s and 60s. And uh, along Gray Street and along Ann Street, they're pretty much all there intact. So that's what you're looking for when you create a local historic district. Is there an area that has a really unique and consistent style? And this is one place where we found that. So the architectural styles within this, not surprisingly, would be limited to mid-century modern. Finally, for the historic overlays, we have the neighborhood conservation district. So like the downtown historic district, this one is going to limit the number of architectural styles that are permitted. And this is the exact same list I'll add as the downtown historic district. We wanna make sure the historic areas both west and east of 41 have the same architectural styles and really create an overall greater downtown that um, you know, feels cohesive in terms of the, the types of buildings and style of buildings that get built. And lastly, we have the medical overlay. So all of the other overlays we looked at really kind of reduce or restrict either the number of architectural styles or the building height that's allowed. The medical overlay does the opposite. So we want to encourage medical related and hospital uses in the medical overlay. So what we did is we created this overlay and within this overlay, any building that has predominantly medical and hospital related uses will be able to go up to a higher building height. So the base height that they're allowed by right would be 60 feet. And the maximum they could achieve with community benefits if they provide, like I mentioned, specific medical uses would be 100 feet and eight stores. And we're happy to hear your thoughts on if we got that number right or not, but we want 
to make sure that the hospital has everything they need. They're such an important anchor in the community. All right, so now for the final important section within the code. We've gone through the regulating districts, the building types, the overlay districts. Finally, it's the architectural provisions. And these are so important to really getting predictable development. And there are three kinds of architectural provisions. There's general building design standards, which apply to all buildings in any district. Then there are frontage standards. These define different types of building frontages and different building types and regulating districts will permit different types of frontages. And finally, we have architectural styles. And we'll go through all of them in just a second. I just wanted to show you all an example of some of the pages from our general building styles. What are we controlling for through these standards? We're controlling for the facade composition, which I know is a fancy word. It just means, what is the rhythm of the doors and windows? Do they make sense? Are they logical? Um, do they create a building that's nice to look at and that fits with what you historically have here? Also the transparency and number of window openings, the entrances and access into the buildings, where do they have to be located? The different roof types that are allowed and specifically the roof pitch, um, where you can have garages and accessory structures, what those could look like, and specific exterior architectural elements, things like moldings and columns and bay windows and balconies. How big can they be? How many can you have? Um, how should they be spaced? And finally, building materials. So the other thing we're controlling through our architectural provision are frontage standards. And these are so important to get that kind of building to street relationship I've been talking about so far. And there's a number of different ones. And we have, uh, again, these are very visual. We wanna make it as easy as possible to see the kinds of elements we'd like to see along the front of the building, whether it's to provide shade, um, to make just a more inviting neighborhood residential street with porches and portico entries, um, but also the, the frontage type known as the terrace. So you can see the terrace, I'll point to it here. Apologies for those online, but it's the bottom right corner. This is a frontage type that allows you to have good access into a retail store or restaurant with room for seating, even though the base flood elevation because of the FEMA requirements has been elevated. So this is a big challenge for communities in South Florida or any kind of coastal communities that have a base flood elevation that's rising, which means every time you build a new building, that ground floor might have to be a little bit higher than it was before. And that can really destroy the kind of street environment that you want, where you have people freely going in and out into stores on the sidewalk. By creating a terrace, you're leaving a public circulation area in front of the store's doors where people can still circulate, where you can put um, cafe seating and still create some of that good urbanism, even though you have to be raising the ground floor because of flooding. So these are all the frontage types that are allowed. We have galleries, arcades, storefronts, lobby entrances, uh, lots of different shading devices from awnings to canopies to balconies that shade the entrance door, four courts, which actually create a little courtyard, terraces, like I've just mentioned, and then a lot for residential buildings like porticos, stoops, uh, three different kinds of porches, and again, entry count canopies and balconies as well. Finally, we have architectural status. So these define standards and rules for materials, roof types, window and door types, porch and entry details, and ornamentation. So I know this list looks similar to the types of things we were regulating in the general building design standards. And that's true. They are similar, but they go into more specifics about what's appropriate for your style of your house or building. So while there are requirements in general, for how many windows uh, or how much fenestration or transparency there needs to be. The architectural styles will tell you exactly what kind of window is appropriate, whether it's casement, double hung, single hung, et cetera, for that specific architectural style, as well as the kinds of ornamentation you might find on the balcony or along the porch that's appropriate for that style. And I'll quickly go through the styles. So we are permitting a Florida wood frame vernacular. This is kind of the Thick wood construction you see very commonly in Florida. 
also folk Victorian and craftsmen, Queen Anne Revival, Georgian Revival, Neoclassical Revival, Mission Style, Mid-Century Modern, Masonry Modern, and Main Street Vernacular. Okay, so uh, now I'm just gonna talk about that community benefit program that I discussed. So in order to achieve some of the goals that we established in the comprehensive plan and through the citywide master plan, um, including compact infill development that not, not only helps to revitalize the downtown and some of the uh, adjacent neighborhoods, um, but it also will help preserve some buildings uh, that used to get built when the density was actually higher than what it is today. But it'll also give Puna Gordia an opportunity to build certain housing types that just aren't permitted today. So just because we are going to allow higher densities does not mean that we're giving them away for free. So there are three tiers three tiers of intensity in the form-based code. One is the base height intensity. This is what's permitted by right in the code for any building in the form-based code area. Then we have what's called the missing middle density. This is permitted by right for specific missing middle housing types in any area of the form-based code except for the traditional residential with a maximum density of 30 dwelling units to the acre. So the building types that allow this extra density are live work, row houses, triplex and fourplexes, multiplex, courtyard apartment, small footprint, footprint mixed use and loft buildings. So again, traditional residential neighborhoods, if you remember way back, it's one of the first regulating districts we saw in the light yellow that covers a lot of the NR10 today. Those are excluded from this because the only building types allowed there are houses, accessory cottages, cottage courts, and duplexes, which have a lower density than these. The third tier of intensity is what we're calling the maximum height and density possible with the provision of community benefits. And this is only allowed in the downtown core, village center, and flex commercial corridor regulating districts. So only three out of all of the districts can actually participate in this program to achieve additional height and density. So here you can see that again. And this chart has all of the actual uh, base, missing middle and maximum intensity numbers. There's a lot to look at here, but I just wanna let you know that again, only those three regulating districts, the downtown core, village center and flex commercial corridor would allow the maximum possible through the community benefit program. So uh, we came up with a list of community benefits, and this is based on all our work during the citywide master plan and the comprehensive plan about what seemed to be the priorities from the community. And this is very much a work in progress, and we're really excited to hear your ideas about this list. Uh, the first one is public open space. So a developer providing public open space, that would be considered a community benefit. Also bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure above what's already required for any development. Public improvements beyond what's already required for any development. Waterfront recreation and boating amenities. Affordable nonprofit art and cultural space. Local business support. And lastly, medical and hospital uses, which only applies to buildings in the medical overlay district. So how exactly is a program like this going to work? Um, so we're creating a point system. No, there it is. So we're creating a point system and certain benefits will accrue certain points. So I'll just show you an example of that. Uh, for public open space, a developer can achieve up to 10 points by providing the greater of 15% of the overall site area or 3,000 square feet of public open space. So if a developer checks that box and is providing that size of public open space, they will get 10 points in this program. And, or they can contribute into a citywide parks fund up to a certain amount that would allow them to get a certain number of points up to 10 as well, just as an example. 
So how the point system works. One point equals one additional dwelling unit per acre in residential density or two feet in additional height. So the maximum amount of points you can get in the downtown core to reach that max level of density that we've set is 15 points. Same with height. And here you can see the different amount of points you need for each of the districts in order to get the maximum amount within the downtown core, village center, flex commercial corridor, and of course the medical overlay because the medical overlay is completely contained within the village center also. Okay, so just as a summary, how do you use this code? We haven't released it yet, but we'll be releasing it soon. Um, and as a kind of summary of everything we've talked about. So step one, where is my property? You have to find where the, your specific property, your house, or your business is within the regulating district. Find out which district applies and if there's any overlay that also applies to that property. Step two is to understand what's permitted there. So what are those development standards within the regulating districts? And then what are the actual building types and architectural styles that are permitted for my regulating district and overlay if I'm within an overlay? And lastly, how should my building look? When I'm ready to renovate or build from scratch, does my building comply with all the architectural provisions? Does it comply with the building design standards? Does it have the frontages that are required for this building type? And is it uh, conforming to the architectural styles that are allowed within the district that I'm in? 